All right. So today, what we are going to look at is a few aspects of the problem of representing signal processing algorithms. Uh, primarily, what we are going to do is look at it from the point of view that how do I represent the algorithm or how do I uh, visualize it in some way that will help me towards implementing it in hardware. Okay. So we'll take some examples to basically understand that better. What exactly is it that we have in mind? To start with, as you are probably uh, aware, any signal processing algorithm, the most fundamental form of representing it in some ways is the equation <laughs> that defines it, right? So, what do we mean by the equation? Examples of this, I, uh, what I'm going to do is basically take two running examples and basically look at them in all the different forms by which they can be represented. Okay. So the first example that we are going to look at is an IIR filter. The equation that defines an IIR filter is y of n equals well, this is one example of an IIR filter. This is not a general IIR filter, but this is one example. right? So essentially, all that it's saying is you have some input, x of n, sampled data. You are generating some output, y of n. And a delayed version of that output, y of n minus 1, is multiplied by some constant coefficient a and added to x of n. Okay. So this is the equation that defines an IIR filter, one particular example of an IIR filter, assuming that A is a constant. Okay. The second example that we will look at is an FIR filter. Over here, y of n does not depend on previous values of y of n, but it does depend on other values of x of n. So for example, this could be One example of what we are looking at as far as an FIR filter, a finite impulse response filter is concerned. The output depends on previous values of the input, but not on previous values of the output itself. There is no feedback, so to say. Okay. So these are just two simple examples of what we would consider as DSP algorithms. There are of course many others. There are transforms, there are uh, uh, various kinds of uh, uh, filters, there are other uh, compression, comparison, uh, the quantization, various different kinds of algorithms that would qualify as signal processing. But these are just two examples that we are going to use in order to demonstrate the ideas behind the different representations. So the equation in some sense is the most fundamental, right? All that it's saying is you have x of n some samples, you are doing some computation with them, and you are generating output samples y of n. Okay. It does not say anything about how x of n is represented. It does not say you need so many bits or you are going to use this kind of hardware or these registers or this clock period. Nothing of the sort comes into the equation. Okay. The assumption is that these are just real valued numbers or complex valued numbers as the case may be, right? with whatever precision is required in order to actually implement the functionality that you need. Okay. All right. So. What do we do with this? When we are moving towards a hardware implementation, there are a few different kinds of visualizations or representations that we can use that help us to understand this a little better. right? And these examples are simple enough that we can straight away jump to something that is called the block diagram or a block level architecture. right? The idea of a block diagram is simply this. All that it's saying is you assume that you know, you are almost drawing it like a circuit diagram, okay? But using certain kinds of blocks with specific shapes in order to represent certain kinds of functionality, right? An example of what the IIR filter would look like, right? We had the equation for it, which was y of n equals <coughs> a times y of n minus 1 plus x of n, 
okay the equation for that could be considered something like this this wire this arrow that i have drawn over here represents y of n what i want is one sample delayed version of that i use this rectangle to indicate that it is some kind of a register or some hardware that can basically result in a one sample delay okay that in turn gets multiplied so i put a box with a cross sign in to indicate multiplication and i indicate the coefficient of multiplication by the side of that and this value gets added to another input which is x of n okay so what we have done over here is we have certain blocks these are functional blocks and we have the wires that are essentially drawn as sort of circuit level connections between them right so you can sort of instantly recognize that this is very close to a hardware representation this is directly sort of saying this is how the hardware will look okay this is in fact potentially if i had these blocks if i had a register if i had a multiplier and adder and so on i could directly implement this in hardware by wiring this up together on a circuit board okay what would the fir filter look like for this <coughs> i would have my input x of n i need some kind of hardware that will generate two <coughs> delayed samples i am essentially looking at it as a shift register right so that what i have over here will be x of n minus 1 and what i here have here will be x of n minus 2 okay multiply each of them by the corresponding coefficients this one by a this one by b and this one by c and add to get y of n at the output right once again i have a whole bunch of hardware blocks right and the connections between them okay why did i choose these particular hardware blocks it's based on some kind of an idea i have of how the uh, functionality could be implemented right and one implicit assumption which we normally don't even think about over here is the fact that i have automatically assumed that a i can add only two numbers at a given time okay that's why i have two input adders and b i have already made the assumption that i am going to add a x of n plus b x of n minus 1 before adding the result to c x of n minus 2 okay does this impact my final hardware architecture how fast it will run etc it could potentially right so the thing to understand over here is the original equation did not have that assumption it did not say in which order you are going to do the addition right but the block diagram has already resulted in sort of enforcing part of an assumption over there so what we will see is all the different kinds of representations that we have are ultimately going to impose some kind of restrictions on or some kind of assumptions on the way that we implement things right and that in turn will affect what kind of information we can derive from those representations okay so the block diagram is one it's a very common one in almost any signal processing book you will come across these kind of block diagram representations right all that the block diagram is saying is this is the equation this is how you could implement it if you had hardware blocks that did all of these things okay another variant of a block diagram is something that is called a signal flow graph and this is something that is more specific to linear time invariant signal processing systems okay or here what we say is i will have for example yeah once again if this is the y yeah okay this usually is used to represent the signal flow and the z transform domain is used to represent the signals right the z inverse then represents one sample delay 
is a inverse when it is appended to an arc like this essentially means that any signal that is going across that arrow that arc gets multiplied by a into z inverse the a is a constant scalar z inverse indicates one sample delay okay which means basically that we could you know eventually come up with this and also any time that there is a junction this indicates addition and this is a branch which basically indicates a sort of splitting of the signal it's not that you know half the signal goes here half the signal goes there it just means two copies of the signal right the same signal is sort of fanned out to two different places okay so you have junctions and branches and these arcs okay using this essentially what we are saying is that the addition at that branch will basically tell us that the functionality that's being implemented by this is y of z equals x of z plus a z inverse y of z okay or rearranging the terms we can basically see that y of z equals x of z by <coughs> 1 minus a z inverse this is the z transform of the filter that's being implemented okay the iir filter so we can directly derive it in this way right superficially and i mean for the most part it is very similar to the block diagram level architecture there are like a couple of different properties in the analysis of these signal flow graphs they are slightly more restricted in scope there are certain things that can be represented as block diagrams that cannot be represented in signal flow graphs but the benefit is once you can represent a signal flow graph there are certain kinds of analysis that are possible that may not always be possible on a block diagram right we'll get to that in a moment before that let's see what the signal flow graph for the fir filter would look like essentially what we are saying is now the x would get multiplied by a z inverse over here and another z inverse over here and from these branches i would have a b and c coming over here i have this structure so that i have y of z right and in this case i can straight away write down that it's equal to a x of z plus b z inverse x of z plus c z power minus 2 x of z right so y of z is equal to a plus b z inverse plus c z power minus 2 x of z okay so this is all the standard transform domain stuff that you are already familiar with right all that it's saying is the signal flow graph directly allows you to represent things in that manner and <coughs> derive the results accordingly derive the transfer function if you need okay there is one important property or one useful property of a signal flow graph that can be useful in certain contexts it is not universally applicable but at least for certain kinds of signal flow graphs if something can be represented as a signal flow graph then you might be able to apply this transformation to the structure which basically potentially in certain cases could give you an alternative insight to what the architecture can look like okay and that essentially relates to the fact that there is a theorem which says that if you can switch all the inputs uh, switch the directions of every arc in the signal flow graph right and replace junctions by branches and branches by junctions and swap the input and output you will get the same functionality okay so what exactly does that mean let's see what it would imply if i was to reverse all the arcs in this diagram right this top arc would go like this direction of this z inverse reverses direction of this z inverse reverses okay this point which was a branch becomes a junction over here where this a arrow has been reversed and 
this junction becomes a branch over here. And of course, I need to reverse the or rather swap the positions of input so that the input now x of z is over here and y of z is over here. Okay, So the theorem essentially says that these two graphs are fundamentally equivalent. They are going to give you exactly the same behavior. Okay, Now, why would something like this be useful? This by So in other words, what we have done is we have managed to invert the direction of all the edges. Right? And we have got another signal flow graph which looks superficially the same. Okay, It looks very similar to what we started out with. But there are or at least there is one subtle difference which becomes more evident when we look at the equivalent block diagram representation for this particular signal flow graph. Okay, So what I am going to do is just draw the block diagrams corresponding to both of these. This one essentially corresponds to what I drew earlier, which is x here, y here, a, b, c. Okay, The one at the bottom, I am once again going to draw it similarly to the top one in the sense that x will be on the left, y will be on the right. Okay but the connectivity will be as seen by the signal flow graph on the bottom. So with this picture in mind, is there anything that you can notice over here that tells you whether one is better than the other in some way? What's the primary difference that you can make out between both of these? So the shifting, the order in which you do the shifting, whether it's before the multiplication or after the multiplication or other. Uh, yeah, you know, what are you multiplying? Are you multiplying the results of the shift or are you and, and then adding or are you multiplying something and then, you know, adding and shifting in some other strange way, right? The important point, the one that ultimately becomes relevant from a hardware point of view can be seen in the context of something that we will be looking at in a bit more detail later, but you already know it. It's something called the critical path of the circuit, okay? So what is the critical path in a digital circuit? It's basically the longest combinational logic path through a circuit. Okay, And in this case, if we look at it, the longest combinational path is essentially going to be like this. right? The multiplier followed by two adders. Okay? Now that's because it's a 3-tap filter. If it had been a 10-tap filter, it would have been a multiplier followed by 9 adders. Okay? In other words, the critical path would essentially have all that, all those additions would end up being on the critical path. Now, should you really do them as a chain of nine adders or can you do them in certain other ways by creating some kind of a tree structure and so on? Yeah, there are a lot of optimizations you can do. But at the end of the day, there are a whole lot of adders that are going to end up in your critical path. Whereas over here, the critical path is essentially going to be always one multiply one add. Okay. Fundamentally, it has been changed in such a way that after every adder, there is a register. Okay. So the output of the addition basically goes into a register. And in that way, effectively, what we are saying is that no matter how many taps this filter has, the critical path is always going to be restricted to one multiply and one add. Okay. So from that point of view, at least, what is the basic critical path that you will get if you straight away look for a hardware implementation of the circuit, it looks as though the second implementation that we have shown over here is probably better. Okay. 
Is there a catch? What's the problem that you can think of in this context? Is it, why do you need a big shifter? So that's one very uh, good point, right? Essentially what is being said is, you know, the x over here will be some number of bits, right? If this is some n bits, then this will also be n bits, this will also be n bits, right? But the moment I multiply an n bit value with something else, the number of bits that I actually need in order to represent the result is more than n, right? If I take two n bit numbers and multiply them, I, I strictly speaking, I need two n bits in order to represent the result, okay? So in this case, what is happening is the multiplication is happening right here. This is n bits, but this is greater than n bits after the multiplier. So the shifters now need to be bigger or wider, okay? That's one problem. I may be able to get around that by sort of saying I'll use a fixed point representation and you know after the fixed point I know that it's fixed point anyway so you know what I'm going to do at the end of the day is I'll multiply to let's say 8.8 .8 numbers and I will round the result off also to an 8.8 .8 .8 value okay so if I do something of that sort I may be able to get around this shifting problem okay but nevertheless it is there it is something that I'll have to deal with there is another problem that I could potentially encounter over here, which is related to essentially something called the fan out. Okay. Can you see if there is any problem with regard to the fan out that I need for signals in either one of the designs? In the second architecture, this X of N, this input is now driving three multipliers, A, B and C. Whereas over here, x is multiply, getting multiplied by a, the output of that first register is multiplied by b and the output of the second register is multiplied by c. So in the first architecture, which by the way is called a direct form 1 architecture, right? I never have to worry about large fan out. The signal is always going through a register and the output of the register is then going to a multiplier and then also being branched out somewhere else. Right? But direct form 2 on the other hand, which is the transposed architecture which has basically been obtained by taking the signal flow graph and transposing it or inverting it, right? as we discussed, that has a problem with so called broadcast. Right? So X needs to be broadcast, meaning that at the same time it has to be sent to multiple different multipliers, right? A, B and C. And that could either result in a high fan out, therefore high capacitance, therefore high delay, or it could result in something that you know, requires like accessing a particular memory location multiple times. Either one of them could potentially be a problem. Okay, Especially the fan out part of it is more likely to be a problem from a hardware point of view. Okay. So bottom line is you can't straight away say one or the other architecture is better, right? This is sort of Pareto optimality as you can think about it, right? All that it's saying over here is I have different implementations. One of them is better from a critical point, uh, critical path point of view. The other one is better from the broadcast as well as the number of bits required for the registers. Okay. So why did we go through all of this? Because the important thing that we needed to keep in mind over here is the signal flow graph representation effectively allows us to come up with these two different architectures for a given filter. Okay. Now there is yet another representation or I should probably call it a class of representations that is called the data flow graph. A data flow graph in some ways is a generalization of the idea of what these architectures are, right? Why I'm saying that it's a probably called, a, you can call it a class of representations is because the core concept of a data flow graph is adapted for many different things. You are no longer restricted to something like FIR filters or even signal processing algorithms. Anything which has a so-called data flow nature 
can be represented using data flow graphs and more importantly people have come up with many variants of data flow graphs that are useful in different contexts okay so i am going to sort of present a very simplified basic version of the core idea of what a data flow graph is but keep in mind that when you are looking at the literature you might come across different variants of this right which are used in different contexts so a data flow graph essentially for the same problems right the fir and ir filter would look something like this i would say that over here i have a concept of something called actors okay they are sometimes also called nodes or vertices in the graph right and there is the concept of firing or execution of these nodes so an actor firing essentially means that it does some work and gen it pro probably consumes some input does some work and generates output okay that's the core idea of data flow it essentially says that you have several actors that have inputs they are waiting for something to appear on their inputs as and when those inputs arrive they consume them in some way do something with those inputs and generate outputs okay an example of this for the case of the iir filter would look something like this there's one actor which i will mark as s which is a source right and this source essentially produces the x of n as outputs okay where does that go it goes to an adder and the output of this adder gets fed back over here multiplied by two things or rather multiplied uh, no okay sorry let me correct that over here we explicitly make the multiplication as uh, uh, an execution and an event and the d on that arc represents that there is a sample delay on that arc okay so this effectively and now i'm not really showing explicitly where the output is but you can sort of see that you know this is y right this one produces x and over here we have y as the output i am not having a separate sort of node to indicate that this is the output node or anything of that sort similarly there is no explicit input node except that the s the source itself indicates that it can generate outputs okay now the one interesting thing about this data flow model is that it sort of can now be thought in terms of a sequence of actor firings right and the whole idea of how is a computation being performed repeatedly can then be encoded as a sort of sequence of firings of the different actors that are involved okay so what i'm going to do is in fact give these actors slightly different names i'll call this a m and this one can remain as s okay <coughs> the idea behind data flow is that it says at any given point in time i can look at all the different actors decide which ones of them are ready to execute and execute them okay of course how do i execute them where do i execute them am i going to run it on a processor or in some custom hardware that's not the concern of the data flow graph representation the data flow model itself is just saying that this is how you can sort of understand the meaning of this graph and how it evolves in time okay so what we say is that there are multiple firings of each of these nodes and a firing sequence would look something like this i could say s0 s1 s2 etc and what i implicitly mean by this is this is generating x of 0 this is generating x of 1 this is generating x of 2 and so on okay every time that s fires it generates a new value of output x okay so s could have this firing sequence s0 s1 s2 i mean the sequence is implicit it is always going to be ascending numbers s0 s1 s2 it has to be numbers like that the question is in the meantime what do a and m do 
okay now how an actor fires when it is ready to fire is determined by the state of its inputs okay and the basic data flow model or one of the models which is basically called synchronous data flow right this is a variant of something called the synchronous data flow model right essentially what it says is every actor has looks for certain number of in, uh, for something tokens on its inputs and if it has sufficient number of tokens it can fire consume those tokens and generate something at its output okay now what does a token look like and how do you determine whether an actor is ready to fire or not right you can think of a token either in this case for the s the source it does not need any tokens for the simple reason that it does not have any inputs so the assumption over there is that a source that does not have any inputs is always ready to fire okay but among the two other actors a and m the question becomes which one is ready to fire and how do i decide that okay let's look at a a is an adder it has one input coming from s and another input coming from m okay as of now i don't see anything on its inputs there's nothing there to indicate that a is ready to fire what about m it has one input which is coming from the adder and the way that i have drawn this diagram essentially says that that input arc has a delay token on it okay so this is essentially what i mean by a token why is it a token you can think of it in some ways as an initial condition right because think about what we are saying y of n equals a times y of n minus 1 in order to compute the value of that equation i need to have some initial condition i need to know that at t equal to 0 or t equal to minus 1 or some arbitrary t what is the value of y only then i can proceed from there okay so effectively this d that i put over here this token is sort of saying okay these are the initial conditions and with these initial conditions you can now start to evolve your data flow graph can now start to evolve okay how does it evolve one step in this would essentially be this one can generate a token out here okay at any point in time it can generate tokens so it can generate 1d 2d 3d 4d doesn't matter you know in principle i can have an infinite number of d's on this particular arc the one from the source to the adder right but i'm going to assume that it just fires once produces 1d okay and in the meantime m also fires what does it do when it fires it basically consumes that initial value and generates a token on its output okay now if i look at the new state of the graph it essentially corresponds to this right and now what i'm saying is if i look at all the different nodes in the graph and try to find out which ones of them are ready to execute right which ones would i say are ready to execute at this point which ones have tokens on their inputs so to say ha huh? a has enough tokens on all input arcs it has tokens okay what about m m does not at this point okay so m is not ready to fire s is always ready to fire for the simple reason that it does not have an input therefore it does not have any dependencies okay which basically means that <coughs> i can then go from this to a next state where a fires and what happens when a fires it consumes tokens from both of these inputs right and produces an output d over here okay 
So what is the sequence of firing that has happened? Effectively, I have had this sequence which basically says S0 fired over here and M0 also fired. After that over here, A0 has fired. Okay. So after the sequence S0, M0, A0, the graph is now back to its original state because if I look at it, these two are exactly the same. Okay. So effectively what I'm saying in other words is that sequence S0, M0, A0 returned the graph to its original state. Okay. This is considered one iteration of the entire graph. All the functions or the actors in this graph have fired once and brought it back and have fired once that essentially is counted as one iteration of the graph. Has it returned back to its original state or not? In this case it has, right? But what I want to impress upon you is it was not necessary that it actually returns any sequence of firing. It is not always necessary that it brings it back to a known state, right? Because Let's look at it. Was this the only possible firing sequence that we had? No, I could also have gone in the sequence M0, S0, A0. This is also valid. Right? What about S0, S1, M0, A0? This is also valid. Why? Because S doesn't have any dependencies, it can fire as many times as it wants. Okay. The problem here is graph has not returned to the original state. Why is that? Because essentially what we are saying is this was S, A, M, after all this firing, I will end up with this state. This was the original and this is after S0, S1, M0, A0. Right? So there is this difference over here. But it's not a major difference, it's just that one extra token is there on the SA arc. Right? But you can see how this is useful. Effectively what it's saying is I can now consider how to sort of think in terms of an iteration of a graph and say okay, you know, by running through these steps I can compute, I can basically finish one round of computation. In this case, one iteration through this graph will result in one new value of Y of N being produced. The next iteration will produce one more output y of n. The next iteration will produce one more output y of n and so on. Okay. The order in which the actors execute in order to complete that iteration is not important as long as the rules of the execution are being followed. Right. As long as I make sure that any actor can fire only when there are sufficient number of inputs, the order in which I do it does not matter. Okay. And that is the crucial point of the data flow graph. It essentially is able to capture precisely what the dependencies between the different actors or the computations in the graph are and then allow you to figure out how to actually perform those computations. Should they be done on limited amount of hardware, on a single processor, on a dual processor system, which operation should go where, all of those things you can experiment with much more easily once you have this data flow model in place. Okay. And we will be making extensive use of this in order to understand data flow as we move, understand the executions or the conversion of our hard, uh, 
algorithms to hardware models or to software implementations as we move forward. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, first things first, a data flow graph does not necessarily directly imply a circuit. It could be software, right? So an actor in a data flow graph can be a function called inside a C program that you are writing. Okay. And why is that useful? I mean, you might think that that's overkill. I mean, why would I ever bother to use actors and this kind of model over here? It becomes useful when you're talking about multiprocessor systems where I could have two processors, for example, and you know each one of them can pick which actor is ready and immediately execute it when it's available. Okay, So that's the first thing to be clear about. This does not, even though I'm drawing it in terms of visually, you know, there are nodes and there are arcs between them, that does not mean there is a physical circuit that is implementing this. It could be software. Now, the second thing is, all that I'm saying by a valid sequence is something that does not violate the requirements of data flow. Okay, one way to understand that would be what is an invalid sequence. So in this case, an invalid sequence would be starting from the original, right? A zero, we are. It's already invalid. Okay, because A is not ready to fire right at the beginning of the circuit, okay? I could go further and say, all right, supposing I do S0, M0, A0, fine, so far so good, A1, again invalid, it has become invalid at this point, okay? S0, S1, M0, M1 invalid okay so the point is why is this invalid because for m1 to execute a0 should have completed only then i'll get a token back at the input of m okay so all of these are examples of invalid sequences right that's all so all that i'm saying is as long as the rules of firing there should be a token present on the input on every input and the firing itself will take one token out of each of those inputs and generate a token at the output. As long as those conditions are satisfied, the sequence is valid. Which means that there are essentially an infinite number of valid sequences that you can go through over here. Right? Now, why is this useful? We will get to it later when we start talking about scheduling data flow graphs onto various kinds of hardware. Okay? And in that context, it will be much more intuitive as to why this kind of model where we sort of separate out the functionality, the dependence of different nodes on each other from how they are implemented. Okay. All right. So we'll stop here for now. Uh, and uh,